all the filmmakers I know or people in the industry, I'd, I'd say maybe 90% uh, are musicians at some level, like almost everyone here. Yeah. Like, yeah, I noticed all the guitars skills. hanging on the walls and uh, yeah. I'm always like, oh, got to go jam. And yeah. my living room is basically a music studio. Really? Just kind of set up all the time. Well, except for Thanksgiving. Hmm. I have to put the table in there. But, um, gotcha. I have Graham, Gramps on the whaling on the... <laughs> yeah, and my kids are influenced a little bit by it. They they have musical skills, so we every nice. once in a while I get lucky and have a jam session in the living room and that's super uh, cool. That's the kind of the reason it's all set up just Sweet. to make it easy. Yeah. Yeah, you have like the the Jackson five or the Secura <laughs> three or I don't know how many yeah. kids you got, but uh two. Two kids, but yeah, music is fun. It just is a good way to kind of stay off the streets. It is. Yeah. It is. And kids, if you're watching, um, I actually wanted to do something to give back to my high school because my art teacher, I was like voted class artist. I got art scholarship, but music was what I wanted to do. Wanted to be a rock star. My uh, art teacher busted out an acoustic and I thought that was like the coolest thing. He kept it like in the storage unit. And whenever he busted out, then I bought one and started writing songs. But it like really kept me off the streets. I was hanging around with some really <laughs> grungy people that made poor life decisions, more more poor than mine. Don't we all? Don't we yeah. all? Yeah. And uh, so long story short, I feel like music saved me. So I wanted to, uh, I reached out to my high school actually, because what was the catalyst for all this creative career, I guess of mine, I guess you could say, is, was the high school battle of the bands. And mm. I forced all my friends I had three of them at the time. Each of my friends, I forced to learn an instrument. So I'm like, Mike, you're learning bass. You're on vocals. And I'm, you're at drums. People need direction. That's yeah, right. They I, need influence. And I was direction. overbearing. I was a little bit annoying. I guess I still am. But uh, so they don't have the battle of bands anymore. And I, I think kids need that. They need something to get their rage out. I was a, kind of an angry teenager. Hmm. Um I was just like angry at the world and I wrote like these dark songs and like we played a metal band and did all that, you know, rocking out stuff. And, uh, was there, is it a, was it a, about rebellion? You know what? I hate authority. I just like, I can't stand people thinking they're better than other people. Even That's though very I, punk rock of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hate like, I guess you could say establishments in, in terms of like authority, like, you know, you tell me what to do and I have to obey even if, I don't know. There's there's just something about the structure of society in general that bothers me where like... Or maybe it's the institutionalism of high school because high school... Is an, that's where it started. Yeah it's, yeah, it's institutional. It's about conforming and learning how to get in line. And mm. a lot of kids struggle with that, I think. Yeah. Especially creative well, kids. Um, is I, there a better way to do it? Uh, I, I was researching something where it's like the creator of the Simpsons, Matt Groening, he went to this weird ass school in Portland and they didn't give out grades. And it was just kind of like this very hippie kind of vibe, but like, obviously he succeeded massively where he didn't thrive too well, as, as far as I can remember in other situations. So for me, um, I think the value of learning was learning people skills mostly in high school and even though i didn't do that very well um that's like the biggest takeaway that again with creativity and art and music and being an art club and being in bands like if i didn't have that i would be even more socially awkward and like probably homeless dead or in jail yeah because but at the same time ironically high school gave you those opportunities yes so it's, it's that, necessary evil yeah yep. yeah I mean, it's a, I think it's very natural as a, as a teenager to feel this rebellion against, you know, your parents, your, your teachers, your school authority in general. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, it's interesting. I think like teenagers are basically genetically programmed to hate their parents and want to get out of here. Like, and like, yeah, I don't want to be around here anymore. I need to get away. And that's like part of our, probably our evolutionary survival so that we're not procreating within the same tribe so that mm. we're, we're propelled or compelled to see what's over there so that yeah. we can go spread our seed or, you know, yeah. uh, 
in a in a different swimming pool so that we're not you know messing things yeah. up i never thought of it that way i kind of equate it to like the eagle leaving the nest there was a documentary about like how the eagles is it's just like okay you're out of the nest if you don't fly you're basically dead so it's natural selection and survival of the fittest and, and yeah evolution. but if you go back in time and history you know like usually that was around 14 15 16 years old is yeah. when you are you're a man married you're a and going yeah. off and making a family and yeah because uh, the life expectancy, building your new tent yeah the life expectancy eh, the expectancy is like 32 years old or something wild like that right so that was midlife right there you have yeah. your imagine having your midlife crisis at 16 yeah like, and <laughs> i think people still do they just it's yeah. just uh, is now again even more contained they're still captured they're still you know told not to go anywhere and stay here and yeah and and um but you know again music let's get back to music because music yeah. is kind of what we were talking about and you said and midlife crisis because that's <laughs> that actually brings it round about <laughs> like people think i ramble and i do ramble but i always like try to ramble in a circle right. where it's a circular ramble where and that's like so a dance i had a a similar um, in grade school, a teacher, Mr. Pfeiffer, if you're out there listening, uh, he brought a guitar and a couple days a year would do a whole kind of show for us based on the nice. guitar and teach us songs and, um, you know, like Alice's Restaurant. He knew all the words to that somehow. And one of my nice. favorite songs, I Lobster and Never Flounder, uh, which I st immediately learned on guitar as soon as I could find the music on the internet. Nice. And um, so, yeah, I think at that age, especially, you know, around, you know, 10, 11, 12, things you get introduced to have a have a long lasting impact. Absolutely. With music, art, something, anything that brings you joy, um, get, look, getting on your bicycle and and wandering around and discovering your neighborhood. Um, those are very like pivotal and influential um, experiences to young people and yeah it, it, it sticks with you so i was also introduced at the same time um introduced to photography in the black and white dark room with uh you know yearbook and newspaper assignments and that developed in me uh, uh wow what is this thing it's a camera it's a lens when i look through this lens everything looks different and then i can capture that and show people what i saw and and duplicate that and it's very uh that was very you know, cool to me. I, I really enjoyed that a lot. And that is what stuck with me the whole time. And, and Mr. Pfeiffer and his guitar and Mr. Key at band, you know, where I learned how to paradiddle on a snare drum. Nice. And, uh, you know, we would have band concerts and go up on stage and, and feel that pressure and excitement and work as a team. And everybody came together nice. and the song, you know, got a, a round of applause at the end. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you know, that was always like a very, um, once you do it, you you like, oh, okay, now I know how to do that. And now yeah. I can. It feels good to be good at something. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, real quick side tangent for people like me that are hyper creative, I guess you could say. And it, maybe it's a, a, a way to curse myself because I never thought I was creative. And I, ironically, I used to say like, music is stupid. Why do people listen to music? It's just words and sounds. And now I'm obsessed with it. Uh, but anyway, so people want to be good at something. A lot of fear and trauma is based on not being good, just sucking and having an inferiority complex. Well, everybody really sucks enough. at first. Yes, precisely. But when you're molded as a, a teenager or preteen, and if you have a little bit of talent and like it starts to impress people like it did with me, my mom thought I was like an art prodigy and everyone's like, well, you're good at guitar, dude. And I was like, yeah, I wanted to hold on and savor that feeling. So like um, in a few ways mentally, like with that feel good, being good at something, I'm stuck in seventh grade. I'm stuck in 13 years old mode where I want to impress people and be good at something. And I'm not that afraid the, of the average, like the average person is trying new things and sucking at stuff. It is way harder though, as an adult, especially as you have responsibilities and stuff and your, your time is less and less and more value, less time, but it's more valuable. So you have to like, be like, is it worth sucking at this new thing for X amount of time before I get good at it? And, um, where was I going with that side tangent? Um, 
So part of my initiative for, oh, this brings it back full circle. Okay, so midlife crisis, <laughs> sucking at something. Uh, I was good at guitar and yeah, bass and blah, 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 and I couldn't sing. I still can't really sing. I could rap a little bit <laughs> and had this midlife crisis. And I was just like, you know what? I kind of have a nervous breakdown and I'm like, this bad, oppor bad opportunity came where I got stuck with a $6,000 bill on an Airbnb for a filmmakers conference because the people decided to cancel. And then I was like, well, I can't get my money back. What do I do? It was like a mansion in Austin, Texas. And I kind of told you a little bit about this, I think last year or, or yeah, something. Yeah, I've seen some videos. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, <laughs> but uh, as much as I can be embarrassed. But with my midlife crisis, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be a rock star for a day. I'm going to make a hip hop music video. I had a song I was working on. Um, I didn't have it finished. Went to the studio, tracked it, wound up being about TikTok. And to bring it a little more full circle is a lot of kids struggle, I think, more and more so with the social media binging that we do with who they are and how to express themselves. And I want to pivot the direction of this documentary film to maybe help people and help them uh, with some kind of value so they don't make the same mistakes as I did. So uh, I think the most uh, Luke lucrative career for kids these days is a YouTuber. Like every kid wants to be a YouTuber or an influencer. And I think there's a right and a wrong way and a spectrum in between to do so. I did the absolute wrongest way <laughs> to try to be an influencer. I lied to people. I, I did like just terrible crap to try to like get an advantage, I guess you could say. And I wear my heart on my sleeve and I want people to, and I see other people doing the same things. And it's not the right way to build a name for yourself or a reputation or, or even a career. And the kids that really want to take this seriously and become YouTubers or, or it's kind of like a cautionary tale, I would say. So the working title so far I came up with is Instagram famous or how to be Instagram famous or how to not be Instagram famous, which is maybe what I should call it because I'm not Instagram famous, but I tried for like a whole week. I just made a bunch of content. I was like, you know, I'll just make all this content. I'll double dip, I kept calling it. It confused the hell out of everybody. There's a hilarious interview with the sound mixer where the sound guy, <laughs> he's like, I'm so confused, dude. There's like 10 things going on. And I have B-roll of him just like playing on his phone because like it was unorganized. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't do the pre-production. I slapped this big thing together, spent an enormous amount of money, somewhere upwards of like $60,000 on this like dream of mine where... I just, I had this midlife crisis and I had this dream and I like went about it the absolute wrongest way possible. And I don't think many people will make those mistakes that I did, but I just, it was like the most painful experience of my life. And I don't want anyone to have to go through that. And I want to have it a cautionary tale as well as be careful what you wish for that message to people, because I felt like a rock star for a day and I was like, this sucks. Yeah. I hate this. I got what I asked for. You know, uh, uh, to bring it even full circle again, you know, everybody sucks at first, no matter what it is. Like you can't, yeah, maybe yeah. you have, uh, maybe you have talent. And your mom says, you you know, you she hangs your art up on the refrigerator, but that yeah. is not, art is discipline. Art is yes. uh, uh, going at it in a methodical and chipping away at it way and doing right, it write that over down, and down. over again. Sorry. Um, an, an artist goes to work just like, you know, anyone else. Uh, and the way they spend their time is improving their skills. So the instant gratification of being an overnight success is truly like a myth. It's a fable or it's yeah. uh, catching lightning in a bottle. It's really, um, it ha it does it happen? Yes. Is the result always good? No. But uh, creating a career or having a life as an artist means waking up every morning and putting on your work pants and going to work and um, and then having figuring out a life balance. Hmm. You know, just because you made a mistake doesn't mean that it's over. 
it just means like you learn something and people spend, you know, 60 grand to go to college. Uh, you can go to Harvard yeah. and get a great lesson in life as well. Or you can do what you did, which is you went after something, you didn't know what you were doing. You learned a ton of stuff along the way. And now if you do it again, you won't do it that way. Like yeah. you're going to do it a new way this time. It'll be like a polar opposite. Right. Like. <laughs> I mean, Edison invented the light bulb with the same That's basic true. science That's principles true. here. That's true. So, you know, the guilt and shame of being an artist is a whole nother topic uh, because, you know, if you don't have support, if you don't have um, a, a mentor, um, if you don't have kind of someone to show you how to do it, yeah. um, you're just going to be guessing. And that's also a strategy, but... It just uh, takes so much longer. Right. And a lot more stress and heartache and re re potentially ruined relationships. And ultimately, that's what I value the most. And that's what made this process so painful. Like almost every bridge was burned in my life. And every relationship was just soured because of the choices I made. And... I'm writing down some some notes and I think what you said art is discipline when I was in high school I was laser focused on being a rock star. I would show up early. I would, I would do my practice my rehearsal I would design the posters. I would track the in the studio Man, I was like I was like a machine. It was great and now um, Balancing life like I really took that for granted when I was a kid man I could have just I don't want, want to say like, I could have been a star or gone so far, but I think everything happens for a reason. And I just want this experience to have value to people. I don't want this suffering to be in vain or, or anything now don't, like that. don't have your feelings no. hurt when it doesn't, when it doesn't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe no one will see this well, thing and it'll just, <laughs> not just that, but like if yeah. you tell a kid, don't touch that, it's hot. <laughs> it's not gonna, that they're still going to touch it because the only true. way they're going to learn is when they touch it and go, that's hot. <laughs> oh yeah, that was hot. Because so I mean, that's cautionary funny. tale is a great you know mm, have a tale. That's, that's good food for thought. Yeah, yeah, the cautionary part of it is probably just for you. Um, Don't do it again, Frank. Yeah, <laughs> telling a kid because telling a kid not to make the same mistakes you is made hot. is a kind of like uh, it's not going to work. Yeah. That's something to really think about. So <laughs> I just got to throw everything I thought out the window now. <laughs> As a guy with teenagers, let me tell you, the, you can tell them a million times. And until they do it themselves, it's okay. just basically. So maybe what I liked what you said with the mentor and a support system, uh, because having those people in my life, like I, I had these teachers in high school and um, we were like buddies. We were, we were friends. Like it was, it was this weird dance of like me uh, pushing their boundaries and respect levels. Like I realized lately too late in life, maybe that I don't respect anybody. I don't respect myself, my parents, like, May, well, it probably <laughs> starts there. It starts with yourself. Cause yes. how can you love somebody if you can't love yourself? Like, yes. R E S P E C T. Um, so yeah, the, the respect thing and the discipline kind of go hand in hand. And I had this theory, th this is, I won't go on that tangent. This, this too big of a tangent. Mm -hmm. Reel it in, Frank. <laughs> so I, I really like what you said about the kids getting burned and they're going to learn trial by, by fire. So how do I make a film that does have value for kids that they're going to get burned, they're going to make mistakes, and this film is, maybe that's what the message has to be like. Everything will be okay you know, you don't have to crash and burn completely and become suicidal or become goth and like seclude yourself from society. And that, that just makes shit worse when kids shut down and put up those walls. Like, like I've seen people do and, you know, lost friends to that or, or they do the opposite and they just become wild party animals and start doing cocaine and overdose or, or who knows what. Well, they found their passion at least, right? With the cocaine? <laughs> 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 well, and, and the, it's, yeah. oh, so that's the other thing too. Okay, so let's just talking about making movies, right? Or yeah. you, compare it the same to creating a painting, right? Mm -hmm. You got to get the canvas, you got to put it together, you got to get the paint, you got to spill it out, you got to spread it all over the place, you got to shape it into what it can be, 
you got to figure out when you're done and then you got to put it out there and move on and yeah. start your next one. And, you know, uh, that's, and what you, I think you learned from your, from your first big mistake was really the problem was planning yeah. and seeing, you know, okay, what, what can we do on day one? What can we do on day two? What can I do on day three? Okay. On day four, we got to clean up and get out of here. Then I got to get into post. Mm -hmm. I got to get all the, you know, so it's really about having a schedule, having a plan, writing it out or really looking at it. And, you know, that's the lesson you should learn from that is yes. just that I just need to be a little more disciplined. I just need to kind of like, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and people can only work so many hours a day. So prioritizing, um, organizing and getting things on, you know, on paper in a visual, you know, whether it's like post-it notes, uh, this scene is this scene, this scene is this thing. In the in Hollywood, uh, an AD uses a one-liner, and that's exactly what it is. It's basically like a sophisticated uh, sticky notes on walls. We break down every line in the script um, as to you know the sh basically every shot or every camera setup as best you can, or at least every scene where all the actors are together and they have to you know read these this dialogue. Usually, a scene starts with interior room, blah yeah. blah blah day. Everything in that column there has to be shot at that same time because everyone is there. Yeah. So creating these like one-liners or and putting the scenes in order, um, not necessarily in the order that they're going to be edited by at the end, but in the way that makes the most sense to shoot them for production. Yeah. And um, and communication is a big thing, and asking for help is a big thing having someone being in charge of all of those things. If it's not your strong suit, if, yeah. if organizing isn't your strong suit, you need to find an organizer. If uh, communication isn't your strong suit, you got to find a communicator. Yeah. And, um, you know, especially when, when time and resources are limited, then you have to be even extra vigilant about organization and mm. scheduling. Uh, it's, because it's show business. It's this creative element that, that you know, where the ideas come from and manifest and uh, have the motivation to propel them forward. That's one thing. But then to actually, you know, that's the art of, and then there's the science. The science is we need people. Mm. We need food for the people. The yeah. people need to rest. The people need to know what's going on. We need paper. We need ink. Uh, Cleaning up after the mess. Yeah, that we, everyone exactly. Makes. We need <laughs> we need toilet paper uh, on set. And then yeah. also, you know, when you're working, you got to be um, clear minded. Uh, you know, you you can you can act drunk, but you don't have to be drunk. Um, you 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 can act crazy, you know, between action and cut. But then the rest of the time you got to be hmm. part of the part of the team, uh, uh, a worker bee. Yeah, that, that's so true. Uh, I always thought like comedians like Robin Williams and those eccentric, really manic energy people like they literally have the right stage for for what they're doing. If they did his act like in the middle of a pharmacy waiting in line like people would like probably call the cops because it'd be like yo there's this guy freaking out like talking <laughs> in weird ass voices doing crazy stuff uh, so the time and place for everything and the rhythm and the organization of that art and science and those skill sets that people bring to the table is so important and that science part is where i'm lacking i was not the best science student you could say in life so I actually did try. I at least had the wits about me to hire people like like Victor. Um, I don't know if you've ever met him. He's a, a great, great, like all around guy, but he's very structured and organized, at least from what I gather. So I hired this dude to like keep me on task, keep me on time, on schedule. <laughs> and I feel bad for him because I think he had a uh, like a capillary burst because of the stress <laughs> of my production. And we actually got footage of him like shaking his head. <laughs> I think it's in the teaser, but um, uh, man, I got I got to wrap up this thought. We got two minutes, oh, okay. twenty seconds on this, and then I can copy the footage and then like 
start a new one. I gotcha. Um, well, I think the, the thing is just move on. Get yeah. get this one done. Get it and done. Button it up, and then uh, get get onto the next one, and mm -hmm. and and take what you've learned and apply it to the next one. And that's where you're going to see your success. Yeah. And that and so your second one might not even be your best one ever. You know, it might be your fifth or your eighth one that's your masterpiece. Yep. Um, but there's only one way to find out. That is so true. Uh, Michael Jackson wrote Thriller after Quincy Jones just kept pushing him, pushing. Actually, he broke down. Michael Jackson was crying. Like he, they went like five days in a row with no sleep. And he's like, Quincy was like, Michael, like we need something that sonically sounds fresh and new to save the recording industry. And they made Billie Jean. And like, I just, I love that kind of stuff, that content, that creators, I, I feel there's not enough of that out there. Maybe there's not a need for it, but uh, I don't know until I try. So uh, future Frank, if you're watching, button this film up, get it done, get it out there, see what people think, and then move on to the next one. That's yeah, all I can never do. Never read the comments. <laughs> don't read the comments. Turn <laughs> comments off. So so maybe I, I can cry in the shower like from other things instead of the mean things the YouTubers well, say. Well, if you're not crying in the shower, do you even have a heart? <laughs> I mean... You should cry uh, in the shower once in a while. Yeah, good, good old fashioned man cry. All right, signing off. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Tom. Pleasure. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Pleasure. Oh yeah, my pleasure. I, you wanna? Do we have time to grab some? You know, I'm. I'm, I'm got... gonna skip lunch, but okay. uh, I want. I, um, I just have a kind of a busy day. It's Monday. This yeah, week just ended. Same here. Yeah, got you. <laughs> like, have... well, the writers' strike. Anyway, that's another whole topic. Ah, uh, that's true. That's true. Well, do your thing. Uh, I can't wait to get together again and have a drum set somewhere. Get yeah, my music definitely. studio together and yeah. And so, what your music studio is? This was that it used to be in here. It used to be in here. Okay, I, I called it Drum Dojo and I had a drum set and basically like everything to just jam and, and kind of write songs. And uh, I want to get back to that. So. It's yeah, a lot of fun yeah. jamming with me. So what's the story <laughs> with the farm? Is it just, uh, do you um, own it or is it? My wife bought a farm. I say my wife because yep, she has yep, the money. <laughs> yep. I'm just, I spend the money and do things like make terrible movies. Sure. Uh, but my wife bought a farm and the intention behind it is to save cats. We have a nonprofit cat rescue, okay. for lack of a better term. Okay. And you need agricultural zoning and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And our so backyard. that's its main focus. That's yep, that's the main focus. Okay. And then... The, the luxury is that there's like four outbuildings and a barn with 2,000 square feet where it's, it's kind of perfectly set up for, not perfectly, it, it could be a good studio space yeah, yeah. for creating yeah, and yeah. writing my songs and maybe doing something like this in there too. Um, but I want to get some, some friends going uh, on a regular basis to just write songs and, and just with the intention, again, to appease our wives and also, the value of making some extra money. If we do, great. If we don't, you know, selling stock music or licensing stuff or music that can, you know, help put food on the table. Because I think, right. I think, um, like, there's so much talent, and it's a shame that it goes to waste with drummers and guitarists and bassists. And I think if we just kind of pulled together with the common goal of, like, okay, let's sit down, let's quit, quit, like, noodling around with our dicks in our hands yeah it makes something really cool because yeah, we can well, finding we gotta... professional that's the whole thing the temptation of music has always been there for me and i've been mm -hmm. asked to you know but it's always like this is not my priority this is not my yeah i i because again i know what it involves now i've been on road so i know like oh, yeah I that lifestyle sucks that. I, I think where it's that. at for for filmmakers is the the bedroom youtuber musician where you don't, yeah. you don't necessarily have to be a YouTuber. Yeah, but there's some kind really of good talent out there on the internet, man. I mean, yeah. like you said, those bedroom YouTubers are, some yeah. of them are phenomenal. Like, would have, and probably have never been discovered if it wasn't for the ability to use your yeah. phone yep. and put it immediately out there. And wow, yeah, I'm always like, it, yep. it, almost dis it almost discourages me to keep doing music because I'm like, I will never be that good. And how but you don't have to be. No, you don't. You don't have to be. You, you know, just you, like Adam Sandler <laughs> is a perfect example. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Al, Yank and Al Yankovic, I <laughs> madly respect yeah. Al Yankovic, and he's like he probably Same is here. a musical genius. Uh, 
but um, but that's not how, that's not what he's known for. What he's known, and he's a billionaire. You know, I mean, he's not a billionaire, but he's a million, multi-millionaire, and very successful, and had a very productive career. Yeah, he just never stopped. Just put on the pants and went to work. You know, and um, yeah, yeah. It's time to put on my pants. Put on the pants. Get put on work. the pants. Chip away. <laughs> it's like how? Yeah. How do you? How do you eat a whale? One bite at a time. <laughs> it's like the, how do you? How do you steal a Cadillac from the dealership? One part. <laughs> yeah. 